We're just going to talk a little bit about our bookkeeping responsibilities when we have money that we earn and money that we spend that we know we have to report on at the end of the year. So the best thing to do, I don't know if you all have a checking account or um, some sort of record that you can do to keep all your transactions in order, but this might help you. It's very simple, very straightforward. Um, it takes the place of a spreadsheet accounting. So does anybody use like Excel or you know any of that? You can just do the same thing with Excel that we're going to do on this. So I, spread, or I passed out the pencils and calculators. And what I want you guys to do is just kind of make some column headings over here. Your first column, this little narrow one at the right, is going to be your date. So you can put date up in the top there. And then your next one, this wider one, is going to be description. And then the next, where we start all these even-sized columns, your first one right here, um, we're just going to put the amount. So you can put, just write amount in your heading right there. And then before we do anything else, let's go ahead and make our first transaction. And let's, does anybody here have a checking account that they have either for personal or specifically for your livestock stuff? Okay, so you're gonna, this is going to help you reconcile every month or, you know, maybe you guys use this already, but for those who don't, it's a good little tool for you to keep in your office or in the barn or somewhere where you can keep a record of everything that you do. So on your first one, just put, um, let's just say January 1st, you opened your checking account and you put $100 in there. So you're just going to put on the description part, opened checking account or deposit, whatever makes sense to you. And then in the amount, you put $100. And what would you do after that? How, we're, we're doing what they call a double-sided accounting system. So we're going to have to balance our, our cash. And then we're going to have to balance the account that it goes into also. So we're going to have our cash going down that first column. And then the next column is going to be how we're going to split it out. We're, it's going to tell us what the cash was for. So on your column beside your amount, you might put um, contribution. That's your owner contribution. And you're going to put your $100 there also. OK. Does anybody have an idea what kind of transaction you might make after you make your first deposit? Feed. Feed. That's a good one. So let's say we go to Nolan Feed and we buy a 30-pound bag of grain. So on your second one, you're going to put your date, whatever, maybe January 15th. And then in your description, you're going to put Nolan Feed and then just put Feed if you need to. Or if you know what Nolan Feed is, then that's fine too, but sometimes you have to put a little more description because when you get to the end of the year, you might need that to look back on. So don't ever short yourself on your description column because you're going to need that. Okay, and under amount, you're going to put $30. I think that's what we said. And on that second column over where the two is, you can put a running balance. I guess we put owner's equity there, didn't we? Sorry. Put your running balance in column two and your owner's equity contribution in column three. Sorry about that. So now you can put a balance that you can carry down all the way, and that way you will always know what is in your checking account. So if you want to subtract that out, you have $100 first in a deposit. Your second one is 30, and you can put that in brackets, so it'll look like a minus. And in your running balance over here, you should have a balance of $70. OK, and in column four, so now we have column one is your, your total. Column two is your running balance. Column three is our $100 deposit. 
column four, we're going to put, uh, the heading there is going to be feed. And then you're going to put on that same line that we did the $30, you're going to carry your $30 over to that column there. So what we're working toward is at the end of the year, we're going to total up everything in the columns and you'll have a column for feed and you'll have a total and you'll have a column for supplies or whatever else we add. So let's go ahead. Does anybody else have an idea what they want to put? A transaction that they may have incurred that they're not sure about, we can talk about it or? Okay, let me add some for you. Oh, go ahead. Do you include the purchase price of the animal? <coughs> mm -hmm. We need to put that in. Um, let's go ahead and add that now. Let's say that you borrow, I don't know, $1,000 to buy a beef. And what are you going to do with that? Does anybody know? Okay, when we, when we borrow money, we create a liability because we have to pay that back. And so sometimes you don't really have to pay stuff back. And, and the difference that what I'm trying to get to is the IRS wants different stuff than what we do for our 4-H records. Okay, so let's say there are a couple transactions that I see this on, and one of them is rent. And I know for 4-H purposes, we like to be able to say, okay, I should have paid $30 a month rent, you know, to keep my livestock at this barn, but since my parents own it, I don't have to pay it. So the IRS does not want those kind of expenses on your tax return, so don't include them for that purpose. And the bookkeeping that I'm going to show you here is for IRS purposes and for management purposes to see what you actually spend. Um, for 4-H purposes, you'll need to include, I believe they like you to include what you would have or should have paid for rent. So has anybody run into that sort of thing on their record books? No? Okay, for our purposes though, we're going to stick to what, what we need to know for the IRS when we get to the end of the year and we have to prepare a tax return. Okay, so let's say that we borrow $1,000 from our, our parents and we're going to go buy a beef. So in our owner's equity column, that contribution line there, go ahead and put that $1,000 there as a positive. <clears throat> and then in our next column over, are we on column four or five now? Is it four? So on column four, you'd put um, liabilities or note payable in that column heading. And you're going to put it as a minus over there because you have a plus in your mount, and, and then you'll have a minus over here. And then you're going to go purchase, maybe you go to a sale barn or wherever you go to get your animal, you're going to put on that next line is probably going to be a check that's going to come out. And you can always put your check number in your description column. Or if you find that you need a column, you can add, you know, make that one of those columns your check number, whatever works for you. But um, you can put your check number there and put who it's to. And then you can come out here and put one of the columns could be cost of, or sorry, livestock purchases. So put your minus 1,000 in your amount. And then you can sub subtract it out right there if you want. It's going to wash from your note that you just added a plus on. So, And then over here in your next column over, I think you're in five, you can put livestock purchased and it'll be a thousand dollars right there. Any questions so far? This is a really basic form of accounting, but it will get you by in a pinch and I didn't know if everybody was, you know, using computers a lot or if they have QuickBooks or whatever, so we're just going to do this basic form. And if you do use QuickBooks, you can enter all your transactions from this spreadsheet too, so it might be a help for you also. Does anybody use any accounting software just out of curiosity? Just familiar with it? Oh, that's good. Okay, so now we have our livestock, we have some feed. Um, let's say we're going to go to a show. Does anybody know what the mileage rate was for last year for IRS tax purposes? 55, 0.555, 55 and a half. 
So what you would do is, let's say you go to Laramie and you show your animal, you'll want to keep track of all the expenses that you incur. So one of those expenses is, is usually travel expenses, gasoline, that sort of thing. Um, the rate that the IRS has is made to cover your depreciation, your mileage, your gas, and everything. So you might want to go ahead and include your gas costs if you go fill up your parent's tank or whatever. And then when you do your tax return, we'll just usually we'll just do mileage. But for, you can put that in there. You might want to put miles traveled. Um, so let's just say that you travel, okay, somebody punches out on one of those calculators. If you travel 130 miles round trip and it's 0.555 per mile, what would your cost be that you could enter there? 72.50. Okay, 72.50. So Go ahead and enter 7250 there. It's a little bit gray because your check might not actually be for 7250, but for our purposes, we're going to say we actually incurred 7250, so we're going to subtract it out. And you guys will see when you get to doing your own that that might cause you a question. So, okay, let's say that you ate at McDonald's and you also spent 850 on lunch. So put that in there on the next line, your meals, and you'll make another column out here for your travel expenses. If you want to include meals and mileage and all that, just make sure on your description that you have that there. So you might have a line that says meals and a line that says travel, and they might all be in the same column over here. Everybody good there? Any questions? No? Okay, what other expenses might you incur during the year that we would need to record here? A vet bill. A vet bill. Okay, good. So on your next line, put veterinary. And then let's say it was 50 bucks. And then over here, you're going to have a column for veterinary. <clears throat> Is anybody doing a running balance yet? Did we run into the red? Yes. Or did we? <laughs> okay, I guess we better get some money deposited, huh? So we probably ought to deposit. We haven't sold our animal yet, so we're probably going to have to borrow some more. Or if you um, have another job or whatever, it's still going to go into that owner's equity column. So go ahead and calculate up how much you're in the red. See what we need. Look at your running balance and see what you need. And that's what we need to deposit, at least. We might have some more expenses that show up. <clears throat> Did anybody come up with an amount yet? Or Heather, do you know? 61? 106. Oh, we're, we're really spending a lot of money, aren't we? Okay, well, we better deposit something. So, so let's go ahead and deposit $200. This is kind of like Monopoly. It's just easy money. So put your $200 in there, and it'll go into your owner's contribution column, and then you should be a little bit in the black. Did she happen to get the new packets yet? Does anybody? Yeah, they're up there. Oh, okay. Got it. While you guys are calculating that out, I'll get these. Who needs one? Well, I guess rumor got out. This is just like the funnest class, so everybody came this year. So, okay, back to our spreadsheet. If you want to, let's just go ahead and keep it simple and. Let's total up our columns for this year, and it's, it should be fairly straightforward. We should have one entry like in most of the expense accounts. Did we get at least one item for most of the things you guys can think about? We got travel meals. Is there anything else you guys, expenses you guys incur that you want to add? Or this, this example is not going to be the one we use for our taxes. I just wanted to show you guys how it would go together, okay? so. 
Yeah, we would have, we could do one for supplies. So when you get to the bottom, after you've entered everything down here, and you get to the bottom and you can total it across like this, you should have your ending bank balance. And then you should have a total for every column that you have. But, and that, those totals should total out to your bank balance also. So there are different ways that you can tick and tie these, but until you get used to it, you know, let's just keep it very straightforward. So then when you get to the end of the year and you have to prepare your tax return, it should all be right here for you. You're going to have your cost of your sales, your livestock purchased, you're going to have your, oh, and when you get to the end of the, do you guys want to do a couple more lines real quick? Because I forgot to add one thing, the biggest thing here, when you sell your livestock. Okay, we need some income. So when you get to the end of the year and you sell your livestock and let's say you get $4,500, then we're going to do on our amount, it'll be $4,500, and you're going to have a column for income. And it's going to come over here and it's going to say income, wherever that is. And that's going to be your sale. Are you guys getting it okay? I'll just walk around. Any questions? You guys have probably done this in ag, right? Yeah. Everybody good? <coughs> and from this worksheet is where everything's going to come from that we get ready to do our tax return. So <coughs> you can go, you can kind of fold that up and we'll just move right along to our tax return packet. And then there are different forms that you can use. I think there's a 1040A and a 1040 Easy, but I just use the regular standard 1040. And you can go out to irs.gov and print this off if you want to hand do it or however you want to do it. It's pretty straightforward. You know, all the top stuff you'll have, that's the easy stuff. You should have that pretty pretty handy, your name, your social, your, the date and everything. So that part's easy. On your filing status, most of you guys will be single. And then, and then when you get to exemptions, this part's a little tricky because most of you guys are going to be dependent still on your parents' tax return. So you can't claim yourself if your parents claim you also, so you don't fill out a number there and darn it anyway, if you could just be claimed twice. <laughs> so that'll be a zero. <clears throat> Does anybody here have a job that they get a W-2 on that in addition to? That's when you have wages, your employer will complete a W-2 for you. So probably if you're working for your dad, it's not the same. You might get an allowance, but hopefully you don't have to report it. So. Anyway, if you get a W-2, you would fill that out on your line 7, your wages. And then you would have, sometimes, you know, have federal income tax withheld also. And we are not going to cover that here because we're trying to just cover the 4-H sale. So if you do have wages from a job, then it goes on here. It's going to cause your, when we get to the bat or page 2, there's a... Um, a standard itemized deductions, it's going to cause that to be a little bit different than what we've come up with here. So just so you're aware, it's fairly easy, fairly straightforward, but it will be different than what we have here. So, okay. So we're just going to pretend like all you have right now is sales from a livestock or the junior livestock sale. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about page one, your tax return? Okay, as we get down onto page one, on line 21, it, I've put a number in here. This is how we're reporting the junior livestock sale proceeds. And this number does not tie to your 1099 number, and you'll see why in a minute. But some people, and some, some people that prepare tax returns, also um, do this on a Schedule F. And we, 
have decided, and it's kind of our firm's policy, that the Schedule F is not necessary for just a junior livestock sale. The 4-H and, and FFA junior livestock sale has a little bit different rules, and um, they're kind of similar to scholarships and grants. That's how the IRS views them. So, so we're going to do this according to what they want us to do. So I know sometimes people will do a Schedule F, but unless you have a whole breeding herd and they're separate from your 4-H stuff, you don't need a Schedule F, okay? Just to simplify it, because the Schedule F can be a little bit more demanding, so. Okay, so that number, if you look back in your packet, the third page back, I have here a little sample, very simple financial statement, profit and loss, that <clears throat> I've done. And if you look at this, you'll always, whenever you add an attachment to your 1040, you want to make sure that your name is on it and your social security number because if that ever gets separated, because we're going to hand file these. We can't e-file these as of yet. So we're going to hand file these, and when those go through the mail and they get to an office in San Francisco or Utah or wherever it is you're filing, they might come apart or get separated. So we want to make sure that everything is labeled correctly. So just make sure that you get your social security number and your name on there right. That's step one. And then you want to also describe on there where that money, where this statement is going to end up appearing on here. So you just put on there, Form 1040, line 21, and that's where the IRS will know to look for the, what ties to this statement. So the next thing we're going to do is under your income, on your sale proceeds, that number right there, and just write on your statement that you have there, that comes directly from your 1099. I think it's maybe box seven or something. I can't remember exactly. But that's the number you'll use right there on your statement. Those are your sale proceeds. If you sell two animals or four or one, they should combine it on one 1099, and that's the number that you'll put right there. And then these other expenses, those are all going to come. Well, I don't have on here cost of your livestock. You can either make a separate category for that or just include it in expenses on your first line. Um, if you raise an animal, you won't have that cost there. So all the other expenses are going to come directly off that spreadsheet that we just prepared. Any questions yet? OK. Um, on here, I didn't make a line for mileage, but you'll want to remember to put your mileage costs are based on the miles that you travel times that rate. And another line that is not on here, and you'll probably just want to note, make a note of this, if you put meals on here, you can only deduct 50% of your meal cost. So make sure your meals are, if you had $100 worth of meals that you, you paid for, that you only put 50 of it on here, okay? Is the mileage the same this year? No, I think it's 56 and a half. And anytime you're working away on this and you want to check that, you know, you can Google 2013 IRS mileage rate, and it gives you all that information. Oh, and the other thing that if, you, if you're into Googling a lot or you're into the web a lot, go out onto the irs.gov. There's a ton of information on there as far as your Schedule F, just about anything that you need when preparing your tax return. But the one thing that's very hard to find is anything that refers exactly to the 4-H and FFA uh, livestock sale, what they require. The only thing I've been able to find is they have that on um, self-employment taxes. They make a little note about if your proceeds are from a 4-H and uh, FFA junior livestock sale that you don't have to pay self-employment taxes on that. So, yes. We don't want that. That's why the IRS views this as um, similar to scholarships. It's called unearned income. And even though you really do earn it because it's a lot of work, the IRS still says it's unearned income. You don't have to pay self-employment taxes on it. 
Does anybody have questions about the income statement or anything you need to know on that? Doing good? Okay, so it gets a little bit trickier as we go. We've got our, we prepared this. Okay, let's do this in order. After you prepare this, then do this, and then start on the tax return, okay? So I've also stuck in some miscellaneous information at the back of your packets. There's some information on your standard deductions versus itemized deductions. You can just look at that when you get a chance. The next thing that you'll see is on chart B. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is for children and dependents. And this is how we decide if you even need to file. Does anybody know what the dollar figure is that you don't have to file? Okay, we'll get to that. Does anybody know um, on your 1099s what the dollar figure is if you get a 1099 versus if you don't get one? Because some people sell an animal and they never get a 1099. $400 Should be 600. Yeah, unless they have different rules here. But, and so a lot of people call me and say, well, I've, we sold this animal, but we didn't get a 1099. Do I report it? And my answer is no, don't, don't worry about it. You know, A lot of times people sell chickens and smaller animals, and it's not necessary to file for that. OK, so if you look on here, on chart B, it says single dependents, and that would be 4-H kids. Were you either age 65 or older or blind? And we're going to say no. And then you must file a return if any of the following. Your earned in unearned income was over $950. So when we looked at our statement, <coughs> this is your unearned income, and it's definitely over $950. We're looking at the bottom line, the net profit. So that would mean that you would have to file. Okay, if you look at those other lines, and I don't want you guys to get too tripped up on it now, but just so you know, it also says if your in earned income was over $59.50, that earned income would be as if you have a job and you have a W-2 that you're reporting. And that's why you need to be careful about um, what you put on the page two of your 1040. Let me see what line that is. where we have that 950, line 40, that number is going to be different if you have a job. And I know a lot of kids do now, so just so you're aware, watch for that. OK, so, we're gonna, so we know we have to file. We're over the $950. All I also stuck in here a chart A for most people. And Really, for most of the kids here, that you won't need to worry about that because the chart B would be sufficient for you. It kind of says a lot of the same thing. But if anybody's wondering or you want to take this home to your spouse and look at it, you can always keep that. It's kind of a handy chart. OK, and then here on this next page, this is, it's the standard deduction worksheet. This is the page where you can fill out this worksheet and it will tell you exactly how much your standard deduction will be. For our purposes, we're going to stay with the 950. I put this in so you guys could use it if you have a job. Okay, So use this to figure out that standard deduction if you have a W-2 and with wages on there, because that will make that different. And then the last few pages that I have are the couple of pages of the tax tables, and I didn't put all of them in here because it would make it too voluminous or whatever. So anyway, um, on your, after you've subtracted out your standard deduction, and you have zero exemptions, your taxable income on the back should be the 1,334. So you should be able to look on your tax tables and find $134. Does everybody see how you get that? And 
and then that's your total tax. For this example, that would be your total tax. And you know, you can, and that's pretty much, well, that's a 10% tax bracket. And you know, that's what we're going to be for 2013. I don't, I don't imagine that your tax brackets are going to change much for these, for just this type of a thing. So just so you're aware. Now, a couple other things that we could talk about here is if you're making income like that, you can always put into a Roth IRA. And I know that might be not something you guys want to think about at 10 years old, but, but you know, that's a really good thing for you guys to, to invest in. And, and I always try to get the kids, my kids to save some, and then they get older and they spend it anyway, but, but at least they have it, you know. So I always try to do that. And then if there's a Roth IRA, they can't spend it so easily. And it can be used for a lot of things besides retirement. You can use a Roth IRA for your first home purchase or um, education. So if those things are something that you want to think about, you know, there's nothing wrong with starting a little Roth IRA for a child, especially if they have a tax return and they have income. Then, then it's OK. You know? Otherwise, you can't just do it on their allowance. Sorry, it would be great, but okay. Um, the other thing that I might also warn you guys about is when you have these, make sure, you know, if you put some into savings and then you still have some income left, make sure that you make an allowance for this. When it comes time to pay that, you want the money to be available. Okay. And then that's really all of it I have on the tax return. Does anybody have any questions about where they send it or how they do any of this tax return stuff? Because you do need to, you do need to file. If you get a 1099, the IRS will have a copy of that, and they will be looking for a tax return. Some people will end up with all zeros on the back by the time you get all your expenses in you should probably go ahead and send that in. Because if you're getting a 1099, you get one copy of it, but the government also gets a copy. So they, and they put that all, it's all automatically tracked, and they're gonna be waiting for a tax return. So if you get one, you probably should go ahead and file. Okay. On the W-2, like if a child has a job, mm -hmm. is your income before or after it's, well, your earned income will be your gross income on page, on box one of your W-2, yeah. And sometimes with kids, um, they don't withhold any federal withholding tax on W-2s. And so if you have that situation and you're below those numbers that we had in our chart, the 5950, you don't have to file, okay? You don't have to file. If you're below that number and you do have money taken out in box three or two, I can't remember, federal withholding tax box, you should file. If there's a number in there, you should file because most likely, most likely you can get that back. So just kind of a tidbit for you there. But. Okay. You can't squeak that Social Security tax in there? No, that don't work, sorry. <laughs> no, and, oh, go ahead. Um, no, if you have a dependent, um, oh, do you mean, do you have to report your child's, no, no, mm -mm. you don't put, they file their own return, and they put on there that they're a dependent of you, and then they get this little standard deduction of 950, and that's good, but no, you just as a parent report your own income. Now, there are some other kitty tax rules that come into play if you have investment, if your child has investment income over $1,900 then you may need to report some of that. And what it does is it tax your child's income at the same rate as the parents. So I don't know if that's good or bad for you, but so, so be it. If their earned income was less than 5950, mm -hmm. more than likely their standard deduction would still be 950 dollars. I don't know. Did you calculate it out? Um, well, we could do a little test. You could just fill out that. Say it was 3000 If their earned income was 3000 let's Let's just figure out what your 
Okay, if you if your earned income was three thousand, um, you would add three hundred to your earned income. And then you also have to watch out because there are these if ands and buts, and it's in the IRS code all the way through. But if it, it'll say if your earned income is such and such, or your unearned income is such and such, you know. So you have to watch that wording. But your table on this page, you should be able to figure that out. Okay. Okay. But if your child is doing other animals that are not selling mm -hmm. horses, oh, stuff, can you, either the parent or the child, use some of those deductions, like boarding and feed and stuff? Cause they're so well, let's let's look at that for just. That's a good question because if your horse if your horse project is actually where you're breeding and selling and earning some income, is that what you're doing, or is you just showing? Okay, I wouldn't even include it. But yeah, if you were breeding and selling and making an income, then you would want to probably use Schedule F. Yeah. If, uh, for example, somebody was beat, mm -hmm. first year in, they went out and bought clipping shoes, oh. spent like a couple thousand dollars on yep. that sled, should they probably make expense that out? On yeah. F, on a Schedule F? Um, no, and that's one thing that we didn't cover. If you buy some large items, those are what we call capital items, and those are those are going to be used over several years. So Arcs. Claim it out over so many years. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. You'd want to probably expense it over five years, five to seven years. But you could set up a schedule, you know, and put that in there. Did everybody understand that? If you buy really big items that are going to they're, you're going to be used more than one year, then you don't want to expense the whole bunch in one year. And for IRS purposes, we need to just take that, you know, a little bit every year. Now, there is something called Section 179, and we can get deeper and deeper into this, but most of the time, Section 179, you can deduct the whole cost of that, but it can't kick you into a loss. So, you know, you don't want to, if you, if you spend two thousand dollars on a clipping shoot and you only have before you've taken any depreciation or before you've expensed that you only have five hundred dollars income you can't kick yourself into a loss for that okay so just take off a fifth of it and you know it might still kick you into loss for that fifth but don't take the whole thing off No, you don't put any receipts with your tax return, but you do need to keep those for three years at least. Yeah. Because you can be audited for three years. So just, yeah, keep your receipts. You know, that should be, you might want to have a big manila envelope or something with your spreadsheet that you have and all your tax records. And just try to be really conscientious of what you're putting, you know, what you're buying, what you're putting in there, what you're recording, and what you're expensing because it might come back to haunt you. I've never seen an IRS agent audit a junior livestock sale tax return. But who knows, you know? I guess, I guess if there are rules and they think that they're being broken, then they would, then they can audit, so. Mm -hmm. So how much of this portion could uh, a kid take for a Roth IRA? Could they use this entire amount? Uh-huh, okay. yep, yep. I don't think they, my kids never wanted to. They wanted a little bit left for them, but you can take, you know, you can use that all. So. And even if you don't use a Roth IRA, it doesn't hurt to have a savings account too. But anytime, and this is, as you get older, and one of the things that 4-H does for us is makes us kind of entrepreneurial. So, you know, you learn some really good basic skills by doing, keeping your records, keeping track of what's working and what's not. And some of that stuff is going to come over as you get into adulthood. You'll, you know, you'll realize how you make profits and, and how things work and how you do a tax return. And that's going to really help you guys. So, so hopefully this class was helpful for, for all you guys or most of you. And this is slightly out of subject. Okay. Being a farmer business, uh -huh. Looks like they're having a good year, and they run out and buy something in November or December. Uh -huh. Use equipment. Yeah. Can you claim that for that whole year or not? I've heard it both ways. For like, if you if you're doing good on your bar farm and you go buy a fifty thousand dollar piece of equipment.
but you don't have enough income to cover it? Yeah, I mean, Is that what you're saying? It's over 10 years. Right. Can you claim that whole year that year? Can you claim it? Well, we had, for, for a few years, we've had bonus depreciation. Has anybody heard of that right. saying? Um, what, and what that did was it allowed us to, any big equipment items that we bought, we could just expense them in that year. Well, that was kind of different than Section 179 because you could kick yourself into a loss with that, which, you know, maybe that was part of your plan, you know, for tax purposes. The thing that you want to watch and plan for is that you might have more income coming into the next year. And with us where we're at now, tax rates are on the, on the incline, and you might want to record that income this year and save your expenses for next year, you know, to help you down the road. So it definitely takes some planning. And with that bonus depreciation, we don't have that so much of that anymore. I think they might be allowing 50%. So, um, and with Section 179, you can't kick yourself into a loss with that. So for your farming purposes, you want to just watch that. But you could bring your income down to zero with Section 179. And you can claim. So you can claim. Right. You can claim as much 179 as, I mean, you can play with that number when you're. Maybe you're going to take it over 10 years or whatever. Right. You can claim that for a whole year. Right. You can take your 179, you can play with that number, get your net profit or net loss where you want it to be using that. And we do that, you know, for planning purposes. It's allowed and that's what we use, so. The bonus depreciation is different. It's like an all or nothing thing. And if you don't, on years that they have that and you don't take it, you have to elect out of that and send an election with your tax return that says, I've chosen not to take bonus depreciation. So. Is that where you can take it all that year? Mm -hmm. And you can kick yourself into a loss and everything. So, and it, it creates other problems, you know. It's, it might be, for the short term, it might be what you want. For the long term, just watch out because you know, it can, it reduces your basis to zero and then you try to sell it and you have a 100% gain on your item because you've already written it off. So, so there are some complications with that, but, so, does that answer your question? Anybody else? Was this class not the most funnest class you've had? <laughs>